Okay, if you would, to begin with, open your Bible to John chapter 1. We're going to use one verse to get started with tonight. John chapter 1, this verse you're familiar with, I'm sure. In John chapter 1 and verse 14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of Him and cried, saying that, this was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have we all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. The verse I'm looking at, it says, 17, The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So, in verse 17, you find the law of Moses, the law that came by Moses, versus the grace that came by Jesus Christ. Now, tonight I'd like to talk to you about law and grace. And I want you to use your imagination tonight. You know, if you're old, you can do that. Old timers used to sit and watch the radio. Kids say, what do you mean watch the radio? That's what we did. There was no TV. You watched the radio and you heard the stories told on the radio and you used your imagination as to what was happening in the story. And so tonight I want to talk to you about, about a trip, an imaginary trip, that Mr. Law and Mr. Grace took with each other. They took a trip, and they traveled together on this long trip. And during this journey they took, Mr. Law and Mr. Grace came upon many problems, five major problems and obstacles along the way. And uh, each one of these problems and obstacles that Mr. Law and Grace encountered on this trip had to do with the salvation and security of sinners. And when they came upon the problem, each man offered his own solution. But Mr. Grace's solution was always better than Mr. Law's solution. Now, first of all, on this trip that Mr. M Mr. Law and Mr. Grace took, the first problem they came upon they were confronted with was the oldest problem in the world, and that's the problem of sin. The problem of sin. And it is the problem. This, the number one problem we have is sin. Sin is what damns men to hell. And so, what can law and grace do about that problem? Can they forgive sin? Can they take it away? Because if they cannot find the solution to that problem the problem of sin, the whole world will end up perishing in hell. That's a major problem. And so when they came upon this problem of sin, Mr. Gray said to Mr. Law, Gray said, Law, you came before me, so I'm going to ask you, what can you do about this problem we run into here about sin? Do you have a solution to the problem of sin? We've got to find a solution, otherwise there's no hope, because all men are sinners, and the penalty of sin is death and damnation. What's your solution? Well, Mr. Law said, i tell you what I can do about sin. I can define what sin is, for sin is a transgression of my laws and commandments. I can expose sin. I can condemn sin. I can prove all men are guilty of sin, and I can judge, I can convict, and I can execute sinners. That's what I can do. Well, Mr. Gray says, well, I know that, Mr. Law, but what, what can you do to take sin away? Take it away. Mr. Law says, well, I'll tell you what I can do. I can provide an animal sacrifice for man's sins, 
that will cover his sins for a while until another sacrifice is offered, until another sacrifice is offered, until another sacrifice is offered for his sins. And Mr. Grace says, but can you take away that man's sins forever? And Mr. Law says, no, I can't, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Mr. Law said, I can do a lot about sin, but I cannot take away sin forever because my sacrifices are inadequate. And so then Mr. Law turns to Mr. Grace. He says, well, Mr. Grace, what can you do about sin? Can you take away sin forever? Mr. Grace says, yes, I can. And Mr. Law says, well, how can you possibly take away sin forever? That seems impossible. But Mr. Grace says, it is possible. And Mr. Law says, well, how? How? Mr. Grace says, I have provided a perfect sacrifice for sin who does more than just merely cover men's sins, but takes his sins away forever. And so Mr. Law says, well, who is this sacrifice you're talking about? Grace says, it's God's perfect Son, Jesus Christ. Mr. Grace said, the Son of God allowed His Father, God the Father, to charge Him with every sin committed by every man. And He allowed His Father to put Him on trial for their sins as if He committed them instead of them. And He allowed His Father to condemn Him for all the man's sins. He allowed His Father to pour out His wrath and anger and hatred against their sins by executing Him in their place. And three days later, God raised Him from the dead. And when God raised Him from the dead, He declared that the sacrifice of His Son fully satisfied all of His just demands against man's sins. And now, God makes an offer to any man who puts their full faith and trust in His Son that He will take away their sins forever and never impute them to them ever again. Mr. Law says, man, that's amazing. And Mr. Grace says, yeah, grace is amazing. It's amazing grace. Well, they're going down the road a little bit further. You got to use your imagination now, folks. Mr. Law and Mr. Grace traveling together. And they come up on another barrier, another real problem. And that's the problem, the optical of eternal life. Eternal life. How can mortal man gain eternal life? How do men become immortal? If a man dies, shall he live again? How can sinful man live forever with God in the kingdom of God? Is there life beyond the grave? So Mr. Grace asked Mr. Law, can you give a man eternal life? Can mortal man gain, him, gain immortality under your laws? If a man keeps your commandments, can he gain eternal life? And Mr. Law if a man dies, can you provide him life on the other side of the grave? What's your solution to this problem of eternal life? Well, Mr. Law says, I'll tell you what I can do. If a man keeps my commandments, I will promise him a long life in this world. Mr. Law says, I've told children that if they keep my commandments to honor and obey their parents, that it will be well with them and they will live long on the earth. He said, I've told children that. And he says, Mr. Law says, I told Israel that if they keep all my statutes and all my commandments, which I command them, that their days will be prolonged on the earth. And I've told the wicked man that if he would turn from all his sin that he had committed, and keep all my statutes, and do that which is lawful and right, he'll 
shall surely live, he shall not die. Well, Mr. Grace says, well, I know all that, but can a man gain eternal, never-ending life by keeping your commandments? And Mr. Law shakes his head. He shakes his head. He says, no, for if there had been a law given, which could have given life, verity righteousness should have been by the law. So Mr. Law admits that no one has ever or will ever gain eternal life by keeping his laws and commandments. We're taking an imaginary trip tonight, John. Mr. Law and Mr. Grace, use your imagination. <laughs> I'm glad you came. Now, <laughs> Mr. Law then asked Mr. Grace, can you give a man eternal life? Mr. Grace says, yes, I can. And Mr. Law says, how is that possible? Grace says that when a man believes on Christ, the Spirit of Christ comes to dwell in that man, and the life of Christ is imparted to that man. And then Mr. Mr. Grace quotes 1 John chapter 5, which says, and this is the record, that God had given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. And so Mr. Grace explains to Mr. Law that anybody who has Christ living in them has life, his life, which is eternal life. Mr. Grace explains to Mr. Law that when Jesus Christ comes to dwell in that person's body, he brings with him certain things. And one of the things that Christ brings with him when he begins to dwell in the heart of the believer is life, eternal life, and it's his life. And Mr. Grace explains to Mr. Law that if a person has the life of Christ, that means that they will live as long as Christ will live, and if Christ will live eternally, so will they. And so Mr. Law says, he concedes. He concedes to Mr. Grace. He says, you know what? You can give a man eternal life, but I could never do it. I could never do it, but Mr. Grace... You can. Mr. Law said, I can't take away sin, but Mr. Grace, you can. Amen. And then it went on down the road a little bit further in this imaginary journey. And they came upon another problem, another obstacle, obstacle. Heard an old colored preacher preach at one time on the radio and he was talking about all the obstacles we run into in our lives. I, I, li I like that. But anyway, they came upon this problem of justification. Justification. How can an unjust man be just with God? How can a guilty man be cleared from the guilt of his sin? Not just forgiven, but cleared from the guilt. And like Job said... How then can man be justified with God? How can he be clean that is born of a woman? That's what Job said. Job solved the problem, you see, about justification. How can an unjust man stand before holy God? Well, Mr. Grace asked Mr. Law, can you justify sinners? Can you do it? Can you clear a sinner from the guilt of his sins? Mr. Law says, I'll tell you what I can do. I can shut every mouth that all the world may become guilty before God. That's what I can do. And Mr. Law says, I can prove beyond a doubt that there is none righteous, no, not one. And I can show that there is none that understandeth, and I can prove there is none that seeketh after God. And I can prove that all men are gone out of the way 
and together become unprofitable. And Mr. Law says, I can prove that there is none that doeth good, no, not one. And Mr. Law says, I can show you that every man is guilty of every sin that my law condemns. Well, Mr. Gray says, I know that. But can you justify the sinners that you condemn? Can you clear him from his guilt? You can find him guilty, but can you clear him from that guilt? Can you pronounce him righteous? And Mr. Law says, no, I can't. Because by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in God's sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. And so then Mr. Law asked Mr. Grace, can you justify the sinners I condemn? Law says, I can condemn them, but can you justify them? Can you clear them from the guilt of their sins? I can find them guilty. I'm a prosecutor. I've never lost a case. But can you clear them from the guilt of their sins? Mr. Grace says, yes, I can. And Mr. Law says, how in the world is that possible? How can you possibly pronounce a guilty man justified? And so Mr. Gray says, by the same man that takes away their sins and gives them eternal life, for by him all that believe are justified from all things from which you cannot be justified by the law of Moses. And Mr. Gray says, Christ justifies all men from all sins that you, Mr. Law, could not justify. Mr. Law, he says, all you can do with sinners is condemn them. But only Christ can justify them. And so Mr. Law says, well, how can, how can Christ justify a sinner? How can God justify a sinner and remain just at the same time? Mr. Law says, does God just overlook their sins and, quote, pronounce them righteous? And Mr. Gray says, no, because that is not lawful. And God would be unrighteous if he did that. And Mr. Gray says, instead, what happened is this. God found every man guilty of every sin that your laws condemn, and God sentenced him to die for their sins, but then God did something else. He came down to the earth in the form of a man and paid the penalty for that man's sins. And now that the penalty has been paid, God can legally justify the sinner and remain just when he does it. So God, he, Mr. Gray says, Mr. Law, what happened is this. God judged the man and condemned the man and sentence the man to eternal damnation, but then that same judge that judged and condemned the man stepped down and paid for the crimes himself, and by doing so, a man can walk out of God's courtroom justified and freed from eternal condemnation. So again, Mr. Grace does what Mr. Law can't do. Mr. Grace can justify the sinner. I might insert a story here that I read one time, and this is supposedly true. It's about, you've heard this story before, about these two boys that grew up together. Uh, they lived in the same neighborhood, neighborhood grew up together. They, all, they went to school together and graduated from high school together. And one boy went on to college and later on became a lawyer and then later on became a judge. But the other boy never went to college and throughout his life, he got in trouble with the law, in and out of the law, out of the courts and out of the jail for a lot of bad things that he did. Well, he was caught doing something wrong. He broke the law. And he was to stand trial in the courtroom of his friend, the friend that he grew up with, who was the judge at that time. And everybody in town showed up at the trial to see what the judge would do with his friend. And so all the indictments were read against the boy, the man, he was a man by then, uh, stating what he did, the law he broke. And the judge, his friend, heard the witnesses and so forth. And after hearing all the witnesses against the man, 
He found the man guilty. Guilty. And boy, then the courtroom said, but what's he going to do now? And then the judge sent it, the judge passed a sentence upon the man, and the sentence was money. It was a money he had to pay, a fine he had to pay, and it was quite a lot, something like $20,000 or whatever. And it was the maximum. It was the maximum he could have charged that boy, with, that man with, for the crime that he had committed. It wasn't 10000 or fifteen, but something like 20000 He charged that boy he had to pay, the man. And man, the people gasped. They just could not believe that the judge, his friend, would make him pay such a high fine, a tremendous sentence to pay. But then the judge, the friend, got up from his chair, came down to the front, took out his checkbook and wrote out the check and paid for it himself. Now, you see what he did? That judge was just in condemning the boy, but he was also justified by paying the fine for him. He just, he just didn't say, well, I'll just let you go free. I won't charge you. Because if he'd have done that, he'd have been an unjust judge. The law said if you break this law, this is the fine you've got to pay. And the judge didn't say, well, I'll just let it slide. No, sir, he sentenced him to the highest maximum payment that he had to pay. But then he came down and paid it himself. Amen. That's what God did. Amen. He found us guilty, passed sentence upon us. It was the worst sentence of all, death and damnation. But then he stepped down from heaven's portals, came down to the earth, and he died for what we did. Amen. That's how grace can do what the law can't. The law can never do that. The only thing the law could do was find you guilty. The law is a prosecuting attorney. And what does a prosecuting attorney do? All he does is try his best to prove that the accused is guilty of the crime they committed and deserve to be punished for it. That's all the law does. But grace is different. Now, grace does not minimize the sentence. Grace recognizes the sentence, but grace provides a payment. And the payment, again, is Jesus Christ. And then they come on down the road a little bit farther on, Mr. Law and Mr. Grace. You know, somebody could make a play out of this, couldn't they? <laughs> yeah. And they came upon another problem, a major obstacle, and that's the problem of righteousness. Righteousness. How can an unrighteous man become righteous enough to stand before holy God? How can a sinner become righteous enough to enter into the kingdom of God? How can an unrighteous man inherit the kingdom of God? Well, Mr. Grace asked Mr. Law, can you make a sinner righteous? You've proven there's none righteous, no, not one, so how can you make them righteous so they can enter into the kingdom of God? And so Mr. Law says this, if a man keeps my commandments... I will count him righteous. He said, I told Israel in Deuteronomy 6.25 that it shall be your righteousness if you observe to do all these commandments before the Lord your God as he hath commanded you. And I warn Israel, the Lord, Mr. Law says, I warn Israel in Ezekiel 18.24 that when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity, and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked men do, all his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned in his trespass that he has trespassed, and in his sin that he has sinned, and them he shall die. And so Mr. Gray says to Mr. Lowell, then here's what you're saying to me. You're saying to me that under your laws, a man was counted righteous if he kept your laws. And Mr. Law says, that's correct. And Mr. Gray says, was it the righteousness of God? And Mr. Law says, no, it was the righteousness of the man that kept the law. And then Gray says, if a man turned away from the law, what happened to his righteousness? Mr. Law said, he forfeited it. He lost it. 
And so Mr. Grace then says, well, so what you're saying, Mr. Law, is that righteousness under you was conditional upon a man's obedience to the law, and it could be lost if he turned away from the law, and that that righteousness was not God's righteousness, but the man's righteousness. And Mr. Law said, yes. He said, just read Ezekiel 18, you'll see it. And Mr. Law says to Mr. Gray, you, do you have anything better? And Mr. Gray says, yes, I do 100% better. And Law says, well, how is that possible? Gray said the problem of righteousness is solved by the same man who solved the problem of sin and eternal life and justification. It's Jesus Christ again. He solved the problem. And Mr. Law says, well, how did he solve the problem? Mr. Grace says, I'll tell you how he solved it. God had made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Grace says to Mr. Law, at the cross, God made Christ to be sin for us. And Mr. Law says, well, what does that mean? Grace says it means that God imputed our sins to Christ on the cross, who in turn died for them. And by dying for them, He paid the full penalty for them. And it's because He paid for them in full that we're given eternal life, we're justified from all sins, we're forgiven of all sins, but that's not all. We're also made the righteousness of God in Him also. And Mr. Law says, well, what does that mean? Grace says that means that God imputed the sins that as God imputed the sins of all men to Christ's account, God now imputes the righteousness of God to men's account. Mr. Law says, you mean to tell me that an unrighteous man an unrighteous man can have the spotless righteousness of God put to his account? Mr. Grace says, yes. And it is an eternal righteousness that cannot be lost like the righteousness of the law. And then Mr. Grace says to Mr. Law, let me tell you about a man that you know because he was one of your strongest supporters in time past, and his name is Paul. And Mr. Law says, yeah, I know Paul well, because he was counted righteous under my law. And then Mr. Grace says to Mr. Law, do you know what Paul did with the righteousness he achieved under your law? Do you know what he did with it? Mr. Law says, what? Well, let me tell you with his own words. Quoting Paul in Philippians 3, he said, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ, and be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. See, Mr. Grace said to Mr. Law, Paul had your righteousness. He had the righteousness of the law. He said he did. But he swapped that righteousness for the righteousness I gave him because the righteousness I give him is eternal righteous and it's God's righteousness. It's not his, it's God's righteousness. And Mr. Grace also says to Mr. Law that if the righteousness that Paul had, or Israel had, anybody had, by keeping the law, if that could have saved Paul and gave him eternal life, why did he swap it? For the righteousness of God. Mr. Grace said, i tell you why he swapped it. Because the righteousness that he had under the law could not save him. It could not justify him. It could not give him life. But the righteousness of God that I gave him gives him all those things and a whole lot more. That's why he swapped it. And Mr. Law says, you know what? I don't blame him. <laughs> good. That was a good swap. 
They move on down the road a little bit further. And Mr. Law and Mr. Grace came up on another problem, and that's the problem of perfection. Perfection. If, if God is perfectly holy in every way, how can imperfect men dwell with a perfect God? I tell you what, Job back there solved that problem. He solved that problem in Job 15. You know what Job said? He said, what is man that he should be clean? And he which is born of a woman that he should be righteous. Behold, he, that's God, putteth no trust in his saints. I don't blame him, do you? <laughs> and I'm one of them. Yea, the heavens are not clean in his sight. They're beautiful to us, not to God. How much more abominable and filthy is man which drinketh iniquity like water? Those are some good questions, aren't they? And so Mr. Grace asked Law, what's your solution to the problem? How can a man who is filthy and abominable dwell with a God who is absolute perfect? Mr. Law says, I'll tell you what I can do. I can give that man commandments to keep. And if that man keeps those commandments and never breaks them, he'll be perfect. And Mr. Grace says, let me ask you this. Has, has any mortal man ever kept your laws perfectly? Mr. Law says, no. Every mortal man that ever walked on the face of this earth has broken all of my laws and commandments. No one has ever kept my laws perfect. And Grace says, if that's true, was any man made perfect by keeping your laws? And law says not even one, because the law made nothing or no one perfect. And then Mr. Law says to Grace, do you have a solution to this problem? And Grace says, yes, I do. And again, the, the person who solves this problem is the same one that solved all the other problems we run into in our journey. It's Jesus Christ. And so Mr. Law says, well, how does he solve the problem? Grace says, here's how, quoting Hebrews, but this man, Jesus, after it offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Mr. Law says, you're telling me that a man is perfected forever when he believes on the sacrifice that Christ offered. And Mr. Grace says, that's what the verse says. And Grace then says that men who put their full faith and trust in Christ's sacrificial death for sin are perfected forever by his sacrifice. Law says, how does his sacrifice perfect them? Mr. Grace says, because it forgives all their sins, blots them out, so they remember no more. And when sin is removed, perfection takes its place, because sin is what corrupts and defiles us. He says that when a man believes on Christ, he swaps his sin for God's perfection. And then Mr. Grace says, I tell you something else, Mr. Law. There's another reason that a man that believes on Christ today is pronounced perfect or perfection. And it's this. He says when sinners believe the gospel, they're baptized by the Spirit of God into Christ. And when they're baptized into Christ, they become identified with Christ. And being identified with Christ, what is true of him becomes true of them. And if he is perfect, then so are they. Mr. Law says, I didn't know that. Grace says, you do now. And then Grace says, there's, there's even another reason why there's perfection under grace. You say, what's that? Mr. Law says, well, what is that? Another reason. Grace says that Christ's perfect obedience to the law is put to the account of those, all those who are in Christ and the law cannot condemn a man who keeps the law perfectly. 
And Mr. Law says, well, I know that Jesus Christ kept my law perfectly. And Mr. Gray says, yes, he did. And Mr. Gray says, Mr. Law, you know as well as I know that Jesus Christ was tempted to commit every sin that every mortal man has ever been tempted by, and he never once gave in to any sin. Mr. Gray says to Mr. Law, Jesus Christ has a perfect record as far as your law is concerned, doesn't he? And Mr. Law says, you're right. He never sinned one time. So he's perfect. And Mr. Gray says to him, what you don't know or need to understand is that when a man believes on Christ, Christ's perfect obedience to the law is put to that sinner's account so that in God's sight now, that man kept the law perfectly because Jesus kept it perfectly. And you cannot condemn a perfect man, can you, Mr. Law? And Mr. Law says, no, I can't. And then Mr. Law turns to Mr. Grace. <laughs> and he says, you know what? It appears to me that Jesus Christ solves every problem we have run into in this journey. Every problem we run up against, Jesus Christ solved them all. And then Mr. Law says, you know what? Seeing this, knowing this now, why would anybody today turn to me to solve these problems? I can't solve a one of them. But Mr. Grace, you have all the solutions, and it's all in the same person, Jesus Christ. And so then Mr. Law says, you know what I'm going to do, Mr. Grace? I'm going to do the best thing. I'm going to go into permanent retirement. And Mr. Grace says, you know something? You've been retired since 33 A.D. when Jesus Christ was crucified and buried you in the, in the tomb and kept you there. He said, Mr. Grace says, the problem with you, Mr. Law, is that people today keep, keep uh, digging you back up and trying to put people under you again. And Mr. Law says, why would they do that? It's insane. I cannot solve any problem that we face today. Why would a man try to dig me up and reinstate me over him again? I can't do anything for him but condemn him. And Mr. Gray says, you're right, Mr. Law. That's religious insanity to even think that a man would resurrect you and put people back under you again when you can't do anything about their sin. You can't give eternal life. You can't make him righteous. You can't justify him. You can't make him perfect. It's insane. And Mr. Law says, I agree. And so the best thing I can do is bring that man to Christ that he might be justified by faith. And you know what? That's what, Roman, that's what Galatians 3 says, doesn't it? The purpose of the law is to drive a man to Christ so that Christ can save him and justify him and give him eternal life. And you know what? If a man has an honest heart, and if he follows the law, sooner or later, Mr. Law will condemn him. I mean, Mr. Law will lay him flat and condemn him and make him give up all hope. And you know what? When a man gives up all hope, that's exactly what God wants him to do. And then the law pushes him toward Christ. The law says, hey, don't trust me. I can't save you. You go to Jesus. Amen. That's what the law does. And when you go to Jesus, you get saved. So, in a way, Mr. Law is still active today. It's just that people today misuse the law. They use the law that was designed to destroy them to save them. That's crazy. The proper use of the law is as a, what, schoolmaster to bring men to Christ. And you know, when you witness, you use the law, the moral commandments, the moral commandments, you can prove that every man who's ever lived has broken every last one of them. They're condemned. But when a man is condemned, that's when he can be justified. He's got to be condemned first. You ever notice that's the way that Paul laid out the book of Romans? Romans 1, 2, 3. What do you find? Condemnation. Condemnation. Chapter after chapter after chapter. Jew and Gentile. But then what do you find in 4 and 5? 
salvation. It's salvation. You've got to be condemned first before God will save you, and nothing condemns men like the law. That's the purpose of Mr. Law. Don't use Mr. Law as a ladder to climb into heaven. If you do, you'll end up in hell instead. Use Mr. Law as a schoolmaster to teach men that they're sinners and they need Christ to save them. And so that's the end of the journey for Mr. Law and Mr. Grace. Thank God for Mr. Law. And thank God more for Mr. Grace. Mr. Grace is so much better than Mr. Law, and Mr. Law admits that. Law says, I can't do anything for a man. All I can do is hurt him. Grace says, I'm the one to turn to. I can save him. I can justify him. I can give him eternal life. I can give him everything that you could not do. All right.